Today on Back to the Bible, prayer doesn't have to be complicated, but there are some essential ingredients to help make your prayer life effective. And that's what Pastor Nat Crawford talks about in today's message. Later, he'll be joined by Arnie Cole and Kara Whitney for encouraging discussion and practical take-home points. But before we begin, let me remind you that right now, your gift to this ministry will go twice as far thanks to a generous $130,000 challenge grant. Now, this grant must be met by September 30th, so please call in your donation today. To thank you, we'll send you a copy of Moving Forward. This is our new fall edition, featuring three months of daily devotions to help you stand firm, stand faithful, and stand on God's Word. Request your copy at 1-800-759-2425. Or if you prefer to give online, visit us today at backtothebible.org. That's backtothebible.org. Now, here's today's message with Pastor Nat Crawford. After a family birthday party, two brothers began their bedtime routine. They took a bath, brushed their teeth, combed their hair. Then they went to their rooms and read a portion of the Bible, and of course, they said their evening prayers. The older brother, he prayed, Dear God, thank you for this day, for the party we could have, and for all the yummy food. Well, the younger brother, he began to pray. He said, Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for letting our family come over, especially Grandma. Oh, and God... Please don't forget, next week is my birthday. So God, and then, the young brother, he looked out the doorway and he began to yell. He said, please, please, please get me that new Xbox for my birthday. Well, the older brother, he couldn't figure out what was going on. He looked at his younger brother and he said, dude, what is your problem? God isn't deaf. It was in that moment. The younger brother got a grin on his face, and he said, No, God isn't, but Grandma is. (laughs) Now, I'm like, that is too funny. But it is so true for how many of us approach God today, isn't it? I mean, think about it. Many of us are just like the younger brother. We turn to God in prayer, but we don't rest in His ability to answer it. What we do is, we make sure we do what we can do to get the job done just in case he won't come through. Prayer is one of the great benefits we have as being God's children. We have a restored relationship with God. Therefore, we can turn to God anytime in prayer. In any time, we can talk to God for conversation. This is a divine privilege. But I know, for many of you today, prayer is a topic of confusion and frustration. I think at times we just don't know how to pray. Other times we don't know why we pray. I think, if we're honest, many of us wonder if prayer even works. These are all common struggles and questions, but I believe that they have biblical solutions. That is what we want to talk about today. Today, we are continuing a series called Growing and Going. This is a series all about growing in our faith and going out into the world to make disciples. In our last message, we talked about being people who are so rooted in Christ that no matter what storms or windfalls come our way, we will stand firm. We also talked about why we should grow in knowledge of God's Word and how to grow in spiritual maturity. Well, today, it is all about prayer. Because the frustrations we talked about a minute ago These are the common frustrations that I hear as a pastor. We just have this common sentiment that prayers don't do any good, that my prayers aren't effective. Again, we've all struggled with this. We've all felt this 
And today is a day that you may feel this way as well. So we want to answer the question, what are the ingredients for effective prayer? What is needed to have a prayer life that makes a difference? Well, I believe that there are seven ingredients that will help you have effective prayer. The first ingredient is we need to pray as God's children. We need to pray as God's children. If we are going to come to God in prayer, we have to be His spiritual children. We have to be followers of Christ. Often on Facebook or Twitter, someone will post something that says, I lost my job today. Prayers and positive thoughts welcome. Now, when I see this online, I have two responses. First, why are you asking for positive thoughts? I mean, have you ever seen this online or heard someone ask this from you? Uh, what, what does that even mean? Positive thoughts? What good will that do? Well, you and I know the answer. None. Positive thoughts have no power. So if you are a Christian, don't ever ask for positive thoughts. This is not a sentiment you want to promote if you're a believer. Positive thoughts are as effective as Cupid's arrows or hunting for leprechaun gold. It's like wishing upon a star or making a wish at 11-11. It's kind of cute to say, but it's not reflective of a Christian worldview. So that's my first thought. The second thought is this. When asking for prayer, to whom are you asking? Who specifically are you asking prayer from? Now, I realize when we put something out there on social media, it's kind of a blanketed request. But for me, when I need assistance, I want to go to the people who can help. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is, with prayer, it is God's children who can help. Now, I know what you're thinking. You may be thinking to yourself, whoa, 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 Nat. Are you telling me that God doesn't hear the prayers of a non-believer? Is there not a reason for them to pray on my behalf as well? Well, I think this is a good question, and I think the answer is yes. I think that God does hear the prayers of everyone, even the prayers of non-believers. Why would I say this? Because God is God. He's omnipotent. He's everywhere. He's omniscient. He knows everything. So God hears all prayers, even the prayers of non-believers. Perhaps the real question is, does he answer the prayers of unbelievers? And if you're like me and you need prayer, you want effective prayer, right? You want the prayers that do something. So does God answer the prayers of non-believers? Well, I think this is a little bit harder to answer, but let me just go through quickly a few passages and let's see what we discover. Well, in James 4, James tells us that when we ask with wrong motives, God won't answer. So, this is for the believers. So, when we come to God with wrong motives, God is not inclined to answer our prayers. In Psalm 66, it tells us that if we harbor wickedness in our heart, in other words, sin, God won't answer. Sin causes a barrier between us and God. The prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 59, he said, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Now again, when we read the word hear, it's not meaning the ability to actually hear the prayer. God does hear it. He knows all, but he is not inclined to answer. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said in John 9, We know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Verses like this in John 9, it gives us the best answer to the question about non-believers. Jesus said, we know that God does not hear sinners. Again, it's not the actual hearing, but it is in the inclination to answer. 
King Solomon said, if you reject hearing God's word, then your prayers are offensive to him. And last, the prophet Micah, he said that those who hate good and love evil, they may cry out to God, but he will not answer them. Now, a simple question is, who hates good and loves evil? Does that describe a Christian or a non-Christian? I think the answer is pretty clear. It is a non-Christian. So, does God answer the prayers of unbelievers? I think that there is a strong case to say, generally, no. However, God is sovereign, and He can do what is consistent with His good and perfect nature. So, generally, no, but possibly and sometimes, yes. So, the previous verses and others in the Bible share many reasons why God may not answer prayers, not just for the unbeliever, but even believers as well. So, again, if I want effective prayer, my best shot is to call upon my friends who know and love God. So, that first ingredient, again, is if you want effective prayer, you need to be God's child. How do you become God's child? Remember, it's what Jesus said in John 14, 6. He said, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you want a relationship with God, if you want to be His spiritual child, then you need to come to Him through Jesus Christ. Well, let's bring in my discussion partners, Arnie Cole and Kara Whitney, and let's talk about prayer. Chances are you've encountered someone and will encounter someone who's thinking to themselves, look, I pray. I pray a lot, but it's just not working. What am I doing wrong? What would you say to that person today if they're listening? I would say that they just don't want to hear the answer. Sometimes it's, wait a minute. Sometimes it's, no. I'll be honest, it's hard. I've been told no, and that's hard. But then I see prayer work in ways where you actually get to see it on this side. And Arnie Cole is a walking example of that. Circumstances in your life, Nat, where Mm -hmm. you know prayer has worked. I think that we just have to trust God sometimes. Yeah, that's, I think, where a lot of people are are possibly at is that they are asking and God is giving the answer. It's just not the answer they want. And, you know, there's that Garth Brooks song, Unanswered Prayers, and and he's not a theologian, obviously, but, you know, he sings that line, you know, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. And I can give an amen every time I hear that line because it's so true. God has the best plan in mind. And so often it doesn't fit into what we think is best. I mean, I'm sitting here right now in the studio because God said no to a prayer that I gave and prayed a lot about. And because God said no to one opportunity, he allowed this opportunity to develop. And I'm forever grateful for the opportunity to be here back to the Bible. So God knows what he's doing The question is, do we trust him? Arnie, what would you say to someone who is challenged with prayer as well? You have to be careful too, and this is my listing, because maybe they're a non-believer. I don't know how to spell theologian, but I'm not one. But on the other hand, I think God listens to everybody's prayer, whether they're a believer or not, and Mm -hmm, and all of mm -hmm. that. For me, if I know someone's in a, a lot of trouble, Maybe they're not a believer. You know, I'll just say, you know, you got to be really careful what you pray for and who you're praying to. A lot of people are really praying to themselves. And if they'll ask, well, what do you mean? I'll say, you know, it's like you're in a relationship, you're married, you're just talking to yourself. You're not really Hmm. talking to or listening to what the other person has to say. And I'm sure if any of you have been in a relationship, you know, your spouse will say, oh, you're not listening to what I have to say. And God answers every single prayer. And it may not be exactly what you want or thought in mind, but it's just, there is no unanswered prayer, but it may not be what you thought how life should have been. 
Challenges, you have plenty of them in your world, but nothing can keep you from growing and going. That's the title of Pastor Nat's current series and the theme of our September challenge. You see, several ministry friends have offered a $130,000 challenge grant, which must be met by September 30th. Their support, coupled with yours, will help this ministry keep growing and going, reaching out to a hurting world with the good news of the gospel. Again, this generous grant will double the impact of your contribution today. And to show our thanks, we'll send you a copy of Moving Forward, Daily Steps for Your Spiritual Journey. This is our brand new fall devotional book featuring three months of fresh new daily devotions to help you stand firm, stand faithful, and stand on God's Word. Request your copy today at 1-800-759-2425, 1-800-759-2425, or make your donation online at backtothebible.org. That's backtothebible.org. Now, here's more of today's message with Pastor Nat Crawford. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I hope you understand what Jesus just said. You do not get to God through Islam. You don't get to God through abandoning desire, which Buddhism teaches. You don't get to God through worshiping a pantheon of gods via Hinduism. You don't get to God through an imitation Jesus in Mormonism or as Jehovah's Witnesses teach. You get to God through Jesus Christ alone. What's the result of this turning to Christ as Lord and Savior? John 1.12 says, But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Jesus Christ, He frees us from our sin. He transforms us from being an enemy of God to being a child of God. Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, He has restored our relationship with Him. Hebrews 4 says, Since then, We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We who have repented of our sins and received God's gift of salvation, we have Christ who makes it possible to come to God boldly at all times. We can approach Him with confidence that He will hear His children. This is what theologian R.C. Sproul had to say. He said, When a person has been adopted into God's family, having expressed saving faith in the atonement of Christ, and having submitted to His Lordship, then, and only then, is one afforded the privilege of calling God His Father. So again, does this mean that God doesn't hear the prayers of people who aren't saved? Are the prayers of the Muslim or the agnostic not heard? Well, what did Jesus say in John 9, 31? He said, we know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Again, we already read it, but let me read it again. Micah 3, 4. Micah says, then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them, and at that time, because they have made their deeds evil. Again, does God hear? The unrepentant person who is far from God? Yes, of course. He's God. He knows all. He sees all. He hears all. But is he inclined to answer those prayers? No. Generally, no. When someone has rejected Jesus Christ as Savior and that glorious and scandalous gift of salvation, 
Is he inclined to answer their prayers? If he chooses to, sure. But I think again from Scripture we can be confident that he is less inclined to. It is the exception and not the norm. This is why the first ingredient to effective prayer is to be God's child. It's a must. It's essential. The second ingredient for effective prayer is to pray with humility. James says this. He says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You see, pride results in thinking you are on par with God. Pride results in thinking your ability in the flesh is enough for this world. Pride is the lie that you deserve God's grace. Pride is a false sense of security and power. Oh, I want you to listen and listen close, and I'm talking to myself as well. God has no tolerance for your pride. He has no tolerance for my pride. Pride got Satan kicked out of heaven. Pride is what got Satan cast out of heaven. Pride is the root of of what got Adam and Eve kicked out of Eden. We, as his children, we cannot have pride and approach the throne of grace. Because pride says, I don't need you, God. I can do it myself, and I will do it my way. Pride is what says, I want a new Xbox, so I'm going to yell it. I'm going to yell it so I can manipulate others to meet my needs because if it's meant to be, it's up to me. But humility, humility is total dependence upon God. Humility is required for effective prayer. This is why in Luke 18, Jesus pointed out that the Pharisee had a dead faith and ineffective prayer. He did this because the Pharisee boasted about his religious actions, about what he could do. He was so confused with his own spiritual ability that he turned to God as a courtesy, but not out of necessity. If you want effective prayer, remind yourself, yes, you are God's child, but you're still human. You still struggle with sin. You can accomplish nothing of eternal value without God. You can't expect your prayer to God to be effective if you are propping yourself up against someone else. You can't expect your prayer to be effective if you are praying out of duty or out of obligation while secretly crafting a way to get your prayer answered. That is pride. It is pride that hinders your prayer. Isaiah 66, it confirms this. It says, These are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. You see, God looks with favor only upon those who are contrite, who are humble. And if we are not humble before him, we cannot rightly expect him to hear or answer our prayers. So let us cultivate humility in God's presence. If you want effective prayer, you need to pray with humility. The next ingredient for effective prayer is to pray according to God's will. Don't you just hate this one? I mean, doesn't God remember? It's 2020. It's about me. It's about what I want. It's about my happiness. It's about my comfort. You see, if we pray God's will, then we might have to possibly change our life 
and our lifestyle. You see, I don't know if we really want to live God's will. I think many of us today, we want our cozy and our comfortable life. So often, at least for me, I pray out of selfish reasons and selfish motives. But if that's not the way to pray, how should we pray? James said this, You ask and do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. If you want your prayers to fall flat, then pray with wrong motives. Let's bring in Arnie Cole and Kara Whitney, and we're going to flip the routine on its head. And they have some questions for me on the topic of prayer. I have one. Well, I'm asking it because I think that a lot of people have this question. And I trust God and I pray. It doesn't stop me from praying. But why do we pray if God is just going to do what he wants to anyway? Yeah. I mean, this is a kind of a cop-out answer, but I think it's the truth. It's a mystery. It is a mystery. God is sovereign, right? God is in control of all things. He permits certain things. He makes certain things happen. But he also is a good father. And we know that he does hear his children. And his ear is inclined to his children who are in accordance with his will, who are obedient. And so he does want to know what is on our hearts and what we desire. But I think part of it also is in our own posture. We talked about how praying in God's will. How much are we submitting our lives to his will? You know, I mean, earlier we talked about, or I brought up my notion of, you know, I was praying for uh, a certain job and the answer was no. And I could be mad at God. I was a little angry at God that I didn't get the job, but I also prayed consistently that God, if this is not what you want, then I will trust you and I want you to move me to the right place. So when I got the no, I said, well, God, you clearly didn't understand what I was saying and you're not listening to me and I trust you-ish, but we need to figure this out. And so over time, God softened my heart and I began to realize that his will truly is best and it got me to a place where I am today. So how does it work? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Because it, because God's ways are not our ways, right? Right. But God has invited us in to make an appeal. We are to be like the widow, knocking and knocking. And when God says yes, in the way that we have described or prescribed, then God is doing what is absolutely best for us. When he says, wait, he's doing what's best for us. And when he says, no, he's doing what's best for us. But does it move God? Yeah, the Bible is clear. It does. How does that work? I don't know. So you would say prayer then could change your circumstance. Maybe not God's mind, but maybe it would change your circumstances. Well, I think that is for sure. It does change, and it does change our perspective on it. God can't change his mind in the sense that God doesn't change, right? God doesn't change. The Bible's clear on that. So it's not like we can persuade him in the sense like, well, God was not going to give me that job, but now he did because I petitioned so much. So that didn't change, but rather I think it is our perspective how we got to that point. You know, it's always baffled me, pray without ceasing. If you combine Kara's question, why pray? Because God already knows the answer and has answered it. Mm -hmm. And then you combine that other concept, pray without ceasing, how do you factor those two things in? I mean, is pray without ceasing is just like a state of being? It's like hanging out with your spouse, someone you have relationship, and, and you don't have to yell at them. It's just you're always in communion? Well, yeah, I think that for sure is is true. We are to be in constant communion with God. So put our petitions before Him and do so continually. The problem is most of us don't do it that way we don't go through life praying without ceasing, what do we do? Play Xbox, read books, whatever hobby it is, live life, work a job. Oh, it's time to eat. Heavenly Father, thank you for this food. Thank you for the great day. Amen. Boom, off we go. 
Okay, that's not praying without ceasing. So it's in that constant communion relationship with him, putting our petitions before him, putting our thanks before him, giving our adoration to him, and even our confession. You've heard that, you know, do the acts prayer, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. If you did that throughout your day, you really could pray without ceasing. So yeah, I think we need to be in that constant communication with him. I don't know how natural it is for most people, because honestly, I get tired of talking to my spouse. I get tired of talking to everybody. But what a great opportunity we have to have the God who created everything, whose ear is always inclined to his children to hear. Answer? That's a different thing. Do you think there's power in praying scripture? Remember uh, that book, um, Prayer of Jabez, that was so uh -huh. popular? Do you think God hears prayer, is more likely to hear your prayer if you pray scripture? Well, the Bible says, James 4, 3, the motives really matter. So a lot of people pray scripture as a good luck charm. I think that's honestly a big part of it. People will use a, that book was a great example. People wanted blessing. And so they picked up the book and they prayed it. And a lot of people got really frustrated and said, look, I did the ABC. Where's my money? E? Well, that's not how it works. Again, it's our heart. It's our posture. What, what are we really trying to get out of it? A lot of people do pray scripture with the right motives and the right heart, and they should. I pray scripture, and when my reasoning is wrong and my motives are wrong and I'm treating it like a good luck charm, guess what? It's probably not going to come true. Uh, I, I talked about this in the message today that I can pray for wealth, and say, God, if you just bless me with all this, I'm going to give it away. But I already got everything purchased, the car, the house, the vacations, and the Pokemon cards or whatever it is you know, you're into. So the motive's all wrong. And so, yeah, pray without ceasing. Talk to God. Tell him exactly what you need, exactly what you want. But above all, we have to pray with the right motives, and we have to be willing to bow to his will. Got one more question, Pastor Nat. One more oh question. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so on with that, as a new believer, I was working in the Middle East with these crazy missionaries that worked in these closed countries. And there was a group that actually yelled in their prayers, it was like a shouting mat. It kind of scared me as a new believer. It's like, whoa. Um, but the, <laughs> the group, very sincere people in dangerous situations. It was during Saddam Hussein's time. But they yelled and didn't scream, but just yelled their request. It was, and it was probably an hour prayer service. It seemed like all day, but I'm sure it wasn't. Do you think that makes a difference? The loudness of our prayer? Yeah. No, I don't. I, I think it goes back to the heart. I don't care if I'm praying in my mind or saying it or yelling it. I mean, again, as you said, it, around the world, you've experienced different prayer meetings. When I go to Mexico and teach at the Bible college down there, that's the weirdest thing. I'll be honest, for me, it's the weirdest thing because we're so used to one person at a time, you know, the Heavenly Father, da, 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 da. Okay, popcorn, you're next. Popcorn, you're next. But down there, you got a room full of 50 people, and they're all going at the same time. And I don't even speak Spanish, so I don't know what's happening. But they are passionate. Mm -hmm. They're sweating. Yeah. They're dancing. Yep. And I'm like, well, maybe I'll try it. And so I kind of, you know, I'm like, all right, and I'll yell uh, a little bit. We got to get video of that. Oh, it, it's it's out there somewhere. But no, I don't. No, I don't think so. And I think that's honestly, as I think about that question. We're, we're all, again, looking for that silver bullet in prayer. You know, we've been in those prayer groups and prayer meetings where someone's praying, and you're like, oh, dang it, that's that's good prayer. I want that. I'm going to do that next time. It's not, it's not about them and what they said or how they said it. Again, it's all about the heart. One of Bible teacher I've gotten to know over the years, studied under quite a bit, and it's funny. I went to lunch one time with this person and the prayer was the, I'm like, oh man, this is going to be so good. The prayer is just going to rock my world. And it was, God, thanks for this time from the food. Amen. And I'm like, what the heck? That's as good as it gets from the, from this famed Bible teacher. That's it. But again, it wasn't about 
standing up, sitting down, yelling, quiet, whatever else. But it was the heart. Hey, thank you for this time. And thank you for this food. Amen. I'm like, you know what? That's pretty cool. So again, I think we need to be quit worrying about the silver bullets uh, and posture of, of our physicality and the tone. It all comes down to the motive and submitting to God's will. This is Back to the Bible with pastor and Bible teacher Nat Crawford. Before we go, let me remind you that right now, your gift to this ministry will go twice as far thanks to a generous $130,000 challenge grant. Now, this grant must be met by September 30th, so please call in your donation today. To thank you, we'll send you a copy of Moving Forward. This is our new fall edition, featuring three months of daily devotions to help you stand firm, stand faithful, and stand on God's Word. Request your copy at 1-800-759-2425. Or if you prefer to give online, visit us today at backtothebible.org. That's backtothebible.org. Hey, Pastor Nat here. Come back again tomorrow and remember, stand firm, stand faithful, and stand on God's Word. If today's message has helped you move forward in faith, be sure to share it. Have a blessed day.